It's a real pleasure to be here to be speaking with all of you. I um, want to make sure you can hear me just fine. So, as we work together on the world's most complex issues, everything from war, terrorism, climate change, equality, um, having basic governance, at the center of all of the solutions, or most of them, is one basic requirement, accountability. It's one that we don't talk about a lot because it's frequently absent, or we talk about it because it is absent, and that's because it's hard. Accountability is hard. So to solve these problems, we have to acknowledge why accountability matters, why it works or doesn't work, and get it right moving forward so we can make sure that we can make progress against these issues. What is accountability? Very basically said, accountability is the state of being accountable. And the state of being accountable is an obligation or a willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's actions. So that can be as an individual, as a community, as a nation state, but that obligation or willingness to accept responsibility and account for one's actions is absolutely essential. I'm gonna give you some very specific cases because why does it matter? Why am I here giving this when we talked about what things I could talk about? I'm like, well, how about we talk about the thing I think about all the time that is stumping me on so many different things? And it's accountability and not enough people are talking about it. Why does it matter? You know, the purpose of accountability is either to encourage certain behaviors, like respect for human rights, for example, or remove or inhibit certain behaviors, like setting the laws for international war, right? Like, we do not want to see these particular behaviors happen. So we set parameters together. We agree as individuals on individual relationships in societies, in communities, in nations, as the international community. We have discussions every day about what our expectations are of each other. What's the world we want to see? What's the community we want to see? What's the family I want to be a part of? But without a way to actually enforce that or to reward what you're hoping to see or not to see, what happens? People, companies, countries, they can take actions that benefit them, have lots of negative consequences on others, and nothing happens to them. Countries can just decide that they can take over other countries because they feel like it. Human rights can be violated with, that, with impunity, no repercussions. Security and police forces can do as they want. Climate change becomes even harder to address because some actors just may not care, or even worse, may be contributing to it, but no one's stopping them. Countries can make constitutions and stand behind them or walk away from them. Like we saw a spate of constitutions in Africa in the last couple of years, where leaders just decided, I know it said I should be term limited, but I, let's just ignore that piece of paper and let's just make me president for life. And they can do it because there's no accountability that's happening or the systems for accountability are not there. Peace treaties are at a greater risk of failure when you don't have strong accountability mechanisms in place. It's hard enough to get the conditions for peace. I mean, frequently, unless there's an absolute winner over the other, you're sometimes dragging parties to the tables, not always, not always in the most forthcoming way, but they're kind of doing it because they know they got no other choice at that point. They've got to figure it out. But those conditions are still underneath the surface. They're balancing by a thread. In Mali, um, anyone who follows the Mali situation, um, there has been long-standing grievances between northern Mali, um, which has been ignored by the national government, resource-wise, and everything else in between. And so there have been many wars and conflicts between the northerners and the government over this. They sign a peace agreement. Soon after, it breaks. They go back again. 
They sign a peace agreement, goes back again. Last round, round number four, the parties who signed said, we don't trust ourselves to be accountable to this peace agreement given the last couple of rounds that went. There was no accountability in place. We don't trust ourselves. I don't trust myself to hold myself accountable to what we agreed to because of the things that are working against me. And I don't trust the others either. So we need someone else to hold us, help hold us accountable. And so the signatory parties to that peace agreement reached out to us at the Carter Center and said, we want you to be our official observer of our peace process. We want you to report on what we're doing. We want you to tell us what's happening and what's happening, because I also don't trust what they're telling me is happening. They're not gonna trust me what I say I'm doing, but if you're independent and you're able to report in ways that are neutral and just fact specific, that helps us have information we can trust. So our team, that our actual, uh, as the observer, we're written into the actual peace agreement as the observer, and our team sits in all the meetings. They're on the phone all day with all the signatories, trying to understand where they're coming from, what's really happening, travel around and verifying data. When they stop docking, they ask us to bring them together. We're not a mediator in this sense, we're, we're a pr provider of neutral information. But they're like, you have recommendations and information. It's one of the few things we can actually have a conversation around at this point. Because they know they need accountability. I'm the first to say, though, we talk about it all the time. Even though we're observing, what happens when they don't follow what's going on? Yes, we are documenting it. And that's important. It goes to the, all the actors of the international community. Look at our reports. Look to us for guidance to know what their stance should be and how they re should respond to the peace process. Um, but there's still some more teeth that are missing from the process, so that makes it challenging. You know, you're dancing a little bit on trying to make sure that you're able to maintain re enough relationships to get information, but also needing to hold them accountable to what actually is going on on a daily basis. So that's, that's a little tricky. You're like trying to have a conversation with people on a daily basis and then when you're reporting on how their things are not going well, that they're supposed to be doing, it's a balance. But it's an important thing to provide. And as um, Richard had mentioned, we also do this with election observation around the world and including more recently in the United States in certain states um, doing the same thing. There are different types of, so this is the story of kind of what the world looks like when we don't have accountability, okay? There are different types of accountability systems. There's horizontal. So those are like the checks and balances that we see inside governments. For example, in the US government, you have the Supreme Court, you have Congress, executive branch. What are the different pieces of a government that can check each other and hold each other accountable for what they're doing? There's a vertical accountability system, which is within an institution, who's checking on others? That can be an internal inspector general. It can just mean your supervisors are verifying what's going on. You've got leadership that's checking on what's happening, human resources. You have a third type of accountability, external accountability. Independent organizations and groups, individuals, that are outside the official system of what you're trying, the individuals, entities, or groups you're trying to hold accountable, and report on it, talk about it, make sure people are aware of what's happening. That can be civil society, non-governmental organizations, media, local non-governmental organizations, as well as international. And then there's a fourth, which is diagonal. Um, and diagonal is when those external groups also, they're putting on the pressure from the outside, are also talking to reformers on the inside or people who do want to hold the line and hold, make sure things happen the way they're supposed to. And that actually is where, a hint, is where you actually see the greatest results in the data, is when you have this relationship uh, between people on the outside putting pressure, talking to people on the inside who really do genuinely want to make things happen the way they should. 
Now, there are various factors to ensure accountability is effective and appropriate. And this is what we really need to reflect on because accountability isn't happening for a lot of different reasons. So let's understand these so that then we can figure out how to design the best systems. The first is that that system or those norms of what everybody wants to see happen or not happen really usually needs to be agreed upon by all the parties, okay? So that can be, I mean, there are some international treaties that are signed by many, many, many different organizations, right? But you have treaties related to demining, for example, that you know, the US government doesn't sign, for example. So you can only go so far whenever it's an agreement. Um, this happens both at the international level, but it also um, happens at local levels as well. You want to make sure everyone is on the same page and is in agreement for what we said. Everyone agrees that human rights are important, for example. International Treaty on Human Rights, for example. As everyone is coming to agreement on what happens, I want to make a really important point clear. A lot of the examples that I'm going to talk about today will be more punitive sounding. But I don't want us to think about accountability as only punitive. It can, there are different ways, remember when I talked about accountability being about taking responsibility for one's actions? Like there are ways also to provide support for people who are taking the right decisions. It can be rewarding certain behaviors. So I'm using a lot of cases that are more punitive, but I also want people to remember accountability can also be what are we gonna do um, and uh, that can be supportive. And it needs to be designed according to what all the people touching the issue want to see. So for example, when I was working in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a, a traditional thing that will happen after there's a peace agreement is people will say, Let's, we need a truth and reconciliation commission because so many horrible things happened here, right? And we need to make sure that there's justice brought to people, accountability, and we think this is the best way. Truth and Reconciliation Commission and go after the people who committed these offenses. But then when we were talking to Congolese, they were like, that's not what we want. We're actually really tired of this war. And if you put forward a Truth and Reconciliation Commission as our system of accountability, one, it's gonna go on for years, which means we're gonna keep talking about this war for years. What we want is to find something that can help us acknowledge what happened, but also move forward at the same time. And we just don't see this type of system, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission working for us. Also, they didn't trust that the government would actually execute anything in the justice system against anything that would be brought to bear. So it would just be really disappointing. Like they would spend years talking about what happened and then nothing would happen. So instead, what, uh, what people raised was, we just need to figure out how to do this in our, in our normal lives, in our day-to-day -day lives. How do we figure this out? So my team, when I was working at USAID, we worked closely with all sorts of psychologists, sociologists, different kind of different leaders, and we designed a system where we knew the biggest challenges and the injustices and the wrongs that had been, happened in these communities theft, murder, massive rape in Eastern Congo. We had to figure out a way for people to be able to feel like there was an accountability for what happened, but also be able to move forward in their communities. So we designed a program that worked at a community level and brought together the returning ex-combatants, the former militants, the same people who uh, you know, raped, pillaged, murdered the communities that they came from and the victims of rape, and everyone else in the community into the same room and talking about, let's talk about how we all got here. Let's talk about the conditions that we all in this community had to face and the tough choices we all had to make and why we made them. And I'll be perfectly honest, coming from the outside, I was skeptical that this would work. Um, but it was being designed by them, and they were like, we think this is the way it should be. This, we think we can make this work. And I was blown away watching how this process moved forward. And it wasn't asking people to give apologies. It was asking people to acknowledge 
the different suffering and choices that people had to make at that time from many different perspectives. But what came naturally still was many, many of those ex-combatants, in fact, almost all of them, coming, stand, asking to stand before their community and their victims and say, I'm really sorry for what happened. Like, I'm, I recognize what I've done and I wanna be like a positive leader for this community. And then they actually went on to, they all agreed on the norms that they were going to use in the community moving forward, whether it was um, uh, respect for each other, certain types of principles, no, non-using violence against individuals in the community. And they ended up becoming the biggest leaders in the community. The people who were the worst perpetrators actually, after giving them the space to acknowledge what they had done, actually went forward and became really positive um, actors in their communities. I couldn't have seen that, but coming when I was originally design, working with the team to design it, but that's okay because the, pro, the point is you work with the people who are involved for them to design what is appropriate to them, what's acceptable to them. Other people might say that is not acceptable to, to me. I want these people to be punished, right? Cultures are different, contexts are different. But you first have to start with getting everyone on the same page and designing it together. Secondly, when we're trying to figure out how to make these systems of accountability work and get everyone on the same page and actually make sure everyone does it, you need to be really clear about what the expectations are of what people should or should not be doing or actors should or should not be doing. Accountability looks different in different contexts. And I'll give an example. Um, when we set down, for example, uh, clarity of what's expected, say, in international treaties or in our laws in our communities every day, if it is not clear, it's very easy for it to be manipulated. So, for example, this includes, I spent many years overseeing a project researching the data globally on what works in police accountability. And there are some foundations that we realized that needed to be in place. Um, the first was the performance management system, which sounds really dull and boring when you're trying to deal with major issues, but the performance management system that said, here is what the expectations are of, your, of performance and what successful performance looks like and the process for recognizing successful performance and holding people accountable was not clear, not easy to hold people accountable to, or just wasn't happening. Um, and so one of the things we looked at was how to improve those those performance management systems. The second, one of the most important things that can be done in police accountability, which you're seeing in police um, uh, units across the country now, many of them, is the use of force protocols. So when people looked at what was happening with cases and would be rightly uh, furious at seeing certain police officers getting off with the types of things that they had done in terms of their use of force. When they looked at those cases, what we found was the use of force protocols were not clear enough to explain what to do in different circumstances. So when you actually looked at it and you say what you've done is wrong, people are like, but I followed what was written in terms of what I was supposed to do in terms of use of force to the letter. So a lot of police um, units now nationally are adjusting it to be more, um, more clear, adjusting it to support, uh, to support uh, de-escalation de uh, rather than an escalation protocol, which was in many of these um, use of force protocols, because they needed it to be clear for everybody about what was appropriate behavior in the most explicit language um, possible so that when it came time that something was done that was inappropriate, people could be held to that. Similarly, some treaties can be written so broadly, it's very open for interpretation. Words like uh, democracy, 
can be very broadly de 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 determined. I always loved how I worked in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and there was not much democracy going on there. But, um, but it's really, people have different interpretations. We just finished an analysis of the, con the proposed constitution for Mali and whether it meets the agreements of the Mali Peace Agreement. And honestly, what it says needs to be in the Constitution. There's some things that are clear, and then there are others that are like general principles, but then when you go to try to compare what's in the Constitution itself, you're like, well, technically it meets the definition of what's in the peace agreement, but is it enough? Eh, not so sure, but I can't really tell them they have to do more because it doesn't say you need more. In addition to ensuring as many people are on board, you also, the other thing that I wanna say is you need to ensure that as many people are on board as possible, as I said in the beginning, designing it together to the idea of the behaviors you want to see or not see. And you need to make sure the consequences or implications for compliance or non-compliance are clear and that the actor cares about them. This again seems obvious, but I'll give some examples. I'll give an example of how you make the repercussions clear and how you create, make sure your um, expectations are clear. I had a colleague who was in the Republic of Congo um, and he worked for the ICRC, the International Committee on the Red Cross. And one of the things that they do is they actually go around the world to all parties and teach them about the international rules of war. What is acceptable? What's not acceptable per all the treaties? So he gets in a car with a PowerPoint projector and a generator in the Republic of Congo, they had an internal battle going on between a few different militia groups. One was named the Ninjas. He's going out to the Ninjas. Um, they were really a scary group, so he was very nervous about it in the first place. Puts his PowerPoint projector and his generator and his you know, computer in the car, drives about four hours into the jungle to go meet with the leadership of the Ninjas um, and all the people around him. So he was sweating bullets as it was because they weren't known for being very um, welcoming, we'll say. <laughs> but they did when he arrived and he's like, I just want to have a conversation and present to you a little bit about and make you aware of what the rules are. So he goes through this presentation, talks about here's what you're allowed to do, here's what you're not allowed to do, you can't target civilians, you can't do this, you can't target people in non-uniform, etc. All the laws of war. And at the end of his presentation, one of the leaders raised his hand and said, well, what happens if we kill an ICRC representative? <laughs> By then he was sweating already because it was very hot in the forest, but he's like, I like triple started sweating. And he thought really hard about it. Like, what do they care about? And he said, if you kill an ICRC representative, you know all those people out there who are like repairing the roads, bringing agriculture support to the, the communities where your families are, the humanitarian assistance, medical support, it will go away because they're not gonna operate in these areas if they know that we're, we're gonna be targeted, right? And we're like, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, I think he uh, didn't come down from the adrenaline for a while. But I illustrate this point because it's both important to show, like, what are the things we need to do to make sure people understand the expectations? None of the people in the ninjas knew about the laws of what they were required to do, nor did they know the implications. But now they do. And they, under they know, and the implications are things they care about. The what people care about is not always obvious. Sometimes we have to test it. In Syria, so it's been, I have a project in Syria, we're working on track two negotiations related to Syria and trying to find a way to move the crisis there forward. Sanctions were put in place and there are a lot of assumptions where people assume that Assad, current leader of the government in Syria, 
cares about the sanctions being lifted. Because you'd think, yeah, they're pretty punitive, right? And we were working off of that assumption. And then we started talking to people and getting a better assessment. He doesn't care about the sanctions. He's found his own way around them. The population cares about the sanctions. So then you have to ask yourself, does the population who cares about the sanctions being lifted, do they have the power if they are given the option of potentially advocating for doing certain things for sanctions to be lifted, will that influence? No, because they don't have the power. So we have to start again think, and think about what, what will move the needle. You know, many of, I spoke to different um, students talking about various different backgrounds. We have to look at these issues from many different angles. Psychology. You know, we're analyzing the psychology of individuals, what motivates them. We're analyzing the sociology around those individuals and the social structures. Don't assume, you have to test it. Understanding exactly what the expectations are and the consequences sounds like it should be basic, but in the cloud of policymaking, Bureaucracy with many actors and the more complex the actors, just getting a clear answer on what the implications are and what you're trying to achieve is challenging. When I was training um, US soldiers going to Afghanistan about Afghanistan and operating there and understanding the culture, my favorite and humbling first question that I would ask is, why are you going to Afghanistan? What are you trying to achieve? If there were 28 soldiers in that room, I got 28 answers. I'm going because I'm going to build a road. I'm going because of this. I'm going because I'm going after the Taliban. I mean, every different answer possible. We couldn't even talk cohesively as a government about what was the objective we were trying to achieve on the ground. How does that look to other actors? How does that look? How do they read that? I get a lot of questions around US Syria policy, people on the ground. Can you please tell me what they're thinking? What is their policy? I don't know. Help me to understand what they want from us because I'm not sure. We, it sounds easy to say we need to be clear, but you have to make it really clear and it needs to be repeated over and over again. And everyone has to be on board. The hardest piece is after all these pieces of being clear and the consequences are clear and the incentives need to the incentives need to be ready to be executed the incentives or the punishments need to be ready to be executed the execution is where things become the hardest number 1 need to ensure you can actually execute these consistency in addition to like clarity of expectations, you have to consistently respond when people do or do not do the things that everyone has agreed upon, okay? I know my son knows that if he asks me for five more minutes at bedtime and I give him once, it's over, okay, <laughs> right? So, and then he just keeps pushing, right? There's, in Washington, D.C., the Georgetown area is notorious because the parking meters there are really, the people who go around and check the parking are impeccable about ensuring that you do not sit in your parking spot for more than one minute. There are clear signs for how long you're allowed to be in your parking spot because there's not a lot of parking in Georgetown. And let me tell you, the parking enforcement police will be at my car five minutes before it runs out with it written out, ready to put it on my windshield. Is it like that in the rest of DC? I know I could probably get away in most places with staying over 10, 15 minutes, I might be lucky. But I know if I go to Georgetown, I better be watching the clock. This is what I mean about like consistency of expectations and consistently applied all the time. It, it, it affects our behavior because we know what is expected and what will happen. This is why people would ask, why do people prefer Taliban justice over the Afghan government's justice system when it's so brutal? Predictability is the number one driver of human behavior. People want to know what's going to happen. And they might not like what Taliban justice provides, 
but man, they know what will happen. They will know it will happen fast and they will know exactly what types of things will happen through and through. And when you deal with the Afghan government's form at the time, you could spend years in that and still not win because of corruption. Consistency is critical. This is why, for example, the US government has a National Security Council. It's trying to rally all of the different parts of the US government together and make sure everyone is on the same page about what the strategy is. But it's also really challenging to apply against different contexts. Particularly when you have competing needs. So for example, I see human rights all the time go toe to toe with other issues and things will be superseded. You see closing space for human rights organizations, but there's other priorities. So maybe, maybe certain countries won't speak out about it because they have interest at play. Uh, I was giving the example the other day of, you know, if another country killed a journalist in the basement of their embassy, how the outrage would be normally, under any normal circumstances. But when it's Saudi Arabia and you have other interests in mind, political will, ability to execute equally, changes. But I want to give the most, cons most obvious example of why consistency matters. Crimea was taken in Ukraine in February and March 2014. When it happened, and I was working on Ukraine at the time, when I hap it happened, we all looked at each other going, people are gonna do something about this, right? They just took a whole part of, a of the country. And if we don't do something about it, they will know it's okay to keep going. And there was a lot of hemming and hawing. There's other different interests. We don't wanna like, maybe Putin will go away. Um, you know, like, you know, afraid about start sparking what we're seeing today. But we knew the moment that we saw Crimea taken and no one said, it's not acceptable to just take a part of another country and decide it's your own. When the international community did not push back, immediately after that, they started on eastern Ukraine. Most people don't recognize that the war actually started in 2014. It's just the rest of Ukraine they've started taking. They've been in eastern Ukraine. They took Crimea. They've been in eastern Ukraine since 2014. We all saw it coming. There was no surprise. And that's because when there are no repercussions to your actions, when there's no accountability for actions like that, the systems and norms get broken. Another example I give is in Syria when Obama said in 2012 that the use of chem-bio weapons was a red line. If Assad used chem-bio weapons, US troops would go into Syria. And then he did. And then the US backed away and said, mm, I know he said that, but actually now we're not. I'm not saying whether the decision to say troops should go in if chem bio weapons were used was the right thing to say in the first place. But the point was it was said and then reversed. And that opened up a lot of things that then happened in Syria because Assad knew he could get away with it. Through the years after they bombed hospitals in clear violation of international law, they bombed a UN convoy of humanitarian assistance that he had approved to go into the opposition held areas. When the international community tried to hold him accountable to that and say, you just blew up the convoy of humanitarian assistance that you approved, that we just spent a week negotiating with you. You know what his answer was? Oh no, that's just the opposition pretending to be us to make us look bad. Or we think you, the United States, actually deliberately blew it up to make us look bad. And remember how I said earlier in the speech about how important it is to lay out exactly you know, what the expectations are? There's a second element of this. 
and it is information. You need the information to be able to make the case about what you're trying to hold people accountable to. So when someone says, no, no, really it was, you know, this group, you actually need to try to find like footage of the people and prove their affiliation. One of my old offices collected the data to prove that Darfur was a genocide. I mean, the work that had to be done on the ground to be able to collect that and prove it, it was done. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it is a key element, this information piece. You have political will, you have information you, that you need to make it happen. You have resources that you need to be able to allocate to make it happen. Uh, Transparency initiatives can really help with this when I was talking about information. The Carter Center has been working in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. All my roads lead back to Congo a lot. But, uh, but they, another team in our, in our organization has been working in Congo related to mine, mining, mining um, resources and the mining companies there who are coming in and extracting resources and are supposed to be paying certain money to the communities to be able to support them in exchange for extracting those resources doesn't necessarily happen, okay? And the communities that are there have no idea what's been agreed upon on their behalf. So we did the research and uncovered over 100 mining contracts and put them on a website, Congo Mines. So all people could look at these agreements and understand what had been negotiated on their behalf, what the expectations were of what the mining companies were supposed to be providing to them so they could hold them accountable. And lastly, I'll say, sometimes everybody has the best of intentions to make things work, but you fall into institutional barriers. And that's some analysis we need to do. The United Nations, the biggest institutional barrier everyone's paying attention to right now is the United Nations Security Council in the way that it's structured. The United Nations was created to be able to problem solve within the international community together to help prevent wars, to set norms and standards, hold different groups accountable. But it is handicapped every time one of those permanent five members uses a veto. You know, you try to push things through forever. They were trying to push through uh, elements related to Assad in Syria and they kept getting vetoed by Russia. Try to take care of the situation in Israel right now, vetoed by the US. All sorts of vetoes happening, so you can't even get on the table what people are concerned about. Lots of discussions about, can we remove the veto? Will people let you remove the veto? Do we stand, expand the Security Council? And I'm not saying these are easy challenges, but what you do is essentially you have to analyze the context so when you're designing how to hold people accountable, you know that in the beginning that this is what's gonna happen. You assess the environment, you say, you know what? If let's pretend a case that things happen like one of the P5 members, sorry, permanent five members, invades another country, how would we handle that? What are the other options? What can we do? What I'll say is when we try to figure out the answer of what can we do, notwithstanding these institutional obstacles, or including these institutional obstacles. There are ways to change them. You build up society on the outside to put the pressure on the people on the inside. You create incentives or disincentives to make sure to create institutional change. I can say after having worked in the US government that institutional change does not happen overnight nor easily. So, <laughs> but it can happen really fast and overnight and easily when there's enough pressure on the outside and particularly enough pressure on the outside to congressional reps who then call the executive branch. Um, it sometimes just takes the right person on the inside combined with citizens taking action to make change. Anyone who's following Israel right now, Minister of Defense Gallant, who stood up and said, no, Prime Minister Netanyahu, you cannot basically remove, any, <laughs> remove the powers of the Supreme Court. He was fired. But he stood up, and because he stood up, in, as someone inside the institution, others started standing up too, because he set the lead, he set the tone. So change can happen, and now we have, I mean, they've postponed it, we'll see what happens, but it has 
at least stalled what everybody foresaw things getting passed this week. So regardless, in every case when determining accountability, we need to be realistic about the situation we have in front of us or change what we have. Idealistic systems of accountability that are unable to be executed or are not consistently executed can be just as damaging as having none at all. The feelings of injustice, distrust, hopelessness of the actors who are hoping to get something out of these systems of accountability, we're hoping that there would be ways to hold people to certain standards or hold countries to certain standards. That distrust, those negative sentiments can really actually poison communities, nations, or like the international community and those relationships. People want and need to see accountability so we can make these changes that they're trying to make for the betterment of their communities, the things they want to see in their states, in their nations. So we owe it to them to learn more, adapt lessons learned, and invest in getting accountability right and being honest with what we're dealing with in the first place. So I'll stop there and because I believe in accountability, I also believe in questions and answers and hard questions um, and challenging because that is what we have to do is challenge ourselves and what we think and believe in order to make sure that these systems actually will work when we take our ideas to implementation. So I'll stop there for questions. Thank you.